Welcome to On My Way to Wealth, the podcast where busy Gen Xers can learn financial tips as they navigate life on their way to wealth. And now, please join your host, Luis Rosa. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of On My Way to Wealth. My name is Luis Rosa, and I'm your host. Today, we're going to be talking to Chloe Moore. She's a certified financial planner. She's the founder of Financial Staples a virtual fee-only comprehensive financial planning firm based in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta ATL in the house. She serves <laughs> clients nationwide. Financial Staples is dedicated to serving entrepreneurs and tech employees. As a certified financial planner professional, Chloe takes a comprehensive approach that helps her clients align their finances with their values and purpose so they can live the greatest lives. In addition to promoting financial literacy through volunteer efforts, Chloe also focuses on the cultivation of female and minority financial planners. Through her leadership, contribution, and volunteerism with the financial industry, Chloe was recognized as one of the investment news top 40 under 40 in 2017. So without further ado, it's Chloe Moore. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, Chloe. This is uh, great. You know, Chloe and I met at the XY Planning Network conference back in like, September, I believe it was. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we just hit it off from there. So I'm very glad that you're able to take some time out to school us here on the topic of stock, stock compensation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Before we get into that, I'd just like us to tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, when did you find your firm? How, why did you go into financial planning? All that good stuff. Yeah. So I started my firm in 2016, late 2016, uh, after being in the industry for about 12 years and, and working for other other companies. Um, and, and I kind of got into financial planning by accident. I'd love to say it's a big master plan, but it really wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I started on a completely different path. I went to school for athletic training. Um, and so I thought I was going to get into sports medicine. Uh, but after taking a lot of biology and anatomy classes, I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I just, I discovered financial planning through a counselor and and it's been a great path since then. Wow. That is so, I did not know that. That's amazing. Yeah. It's just amazing how many people are here go to school for one thing and just end up doing something completely different. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that is awesome. So tell me what clients you work with at Financial Staples. Yeah. So my clients are generally anywhere from their late 20s to late 40s, and they're generally tech employees or entrepreneurs. Okay. Awesome. Well, there's definitely a big need for that. And we're going to learn a lot about why today. So tell us a little bit about uh, what is stock compensation? Yeah, a lot of people hear, hear those words and they have no clue what that means. <laughs> so, um, so stock compensation is really a component of your total compensation. So if you think about you know, your salary, your cash bonuses, uh, your benefits that you receive, like health insurance, uh, disability insurance, things like that, 401k, um, you also, some, some employees receive stock in their company as a form of compensation as well. Got it. Uh, so is that, uh, so um, I guess then the company has to be a publicly traded firm or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Okay. Got it. So, so the employees get as an option of their benefits, some way that they can own a little bit of that firm. Got it. Okay. Awesome. So why is stock compensation so important nowadays? Yeah, so there are several reasons. Uh, the first one is that it's becoming increasingly more common as a way to recruit and retain employees. So most people probably heard of stock compensation, something that big corporate executives receive at these big public companies. But now it's more common for just employees at all different levels to receive stock compensation, especially in the tech ecosystem. Gotcha. Yeah, that's true. I, I always, even myself, I thought about stock compensation and I, and I just think about like, the, you know, like when you hear like, oh, Facebook just went public and you hear like this big executive get some stock in it, but day-to-day -day employees also get that option too, more increasingly now. So that's a very good point. So let's say, uh, can you tell us a little bit of like the different types of stock compensation options? Sure. And before I start, I did want to give a disclaimer. <laughs> so I'll oh, yes. Say, By all yeah. <laughs> but I did want to say stock compensation is very complex. I and mean, I know we have a very short period of time here to talk. So um, I'm only going to scratch the surface a little bit. And I highly recommend that anybody who has stock compensation, that they work with a financial planner or a tax professional um, who's very familiar with it and can help them. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we, you could write an entire book about this for sure. <laughs> yeah, there are books about it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sure, yeah. So we'll we'll do a very high level. So thank you for that disclaimer. So yeah, tell us a little bit about the different types of stock options. Yeah, so there, there's different types of comp stock compensation. Um, for the sake of time, we'll talk about two different types here. Uh, and the first one is stock options. And, and the second one is restricted stock units. So, so to explain stock options, it's basically the right to buy shares of company stock for a fixed price, uh, which is called an exercise price, during a fixed period of time. And that's usually about 10 years. Um, so there's two types of stock options. You'll pro you've probably heard of non-qualified stock options and incentive stock options. Uh, for restricted stock, stock units, that's basically your, com your company's promise to give you shares of stock in the company as soon as certain conditions are met. So the most common condition could be time with the company, but you could also have certain performance metrics. Um, so, so getting a restricted stock unit is like getting a cash bonus and then using that cash to immediately buy company stock. Mm, got it. Yeah. And the key difference between restricted stock units or RSUs and stock options is that RSUs always have some kind of value as long as the company has a value. Okay. Got it. So the RSUs, the restricted stock units, are you said there's some limitations there. So it's kind of similar like when, when an employer contributes a matching contribution to your 401k and you have to wait a certain time to like vest, right? So where the employer contributions are yours to keep it similar in that regard. Exactly. So, so as an example for restricted stock units, um, your company could promise to give you a certain number of shares if you stay with the company for four years. And so at, after each year, you get a, a quarter. Okay, got it. So it's a way for employers to help with retention, I guess, right? Yes. Incentivize you to stay. Okay. Can you give us some examples? Yeah. So going back to stock options, like I said, it's the right to buy shares of company stock for a fixed price. Um, and so so with a stock, stock option, your company could give you the right to buy 100 shares of company stock for $100 a share. So after the first year, you're able to, to exercise or buy 25 shares. And so if the current value of the stock is $120 a share, then your option allows you to buy, buy it for $20 less than what the market price is. Got it. Yeah. So if the current value of the stock was $80 a share, then your option is really worthless because it's cheaper to just buy the stock in the market. Got it. Okay. So this is different than buying stocks in your 401k, right? Because if you buy it in your 401k, uh, typically you will pay market price for the most yes. part. Got it. Okay. So here you're getting some sort of break as part of uh, the option. Oh, awesome. Exactly. That's very important to know. So then let's say, what are some of the key decisions that you need to take into account so with stock options, um, the key decisions to think about are when to exercise, um, how to exercise, and when to sell. And then with restricted stock units, the, the key decision, since you already, you already have the stock as soon as it's vested, the key decision there is just when to sell the stock. Okay, got it. So I would imagine that there are some tax considerations to take into account? Yeah, so there's a, there's a few tax considerations. Um, for stock options, basically the difference between the exercise price and the stock price on the exercise date is, is taxable. So the tax impact you know, varies depending on what type of stock options you have. Uh, but you know, in our previous example, where the stock price at exercise was $120 a share mm -hmm. and the exercise price was $100 a share, that $20 difference is what's going to be taxable to you. Okay. And is that taxable as ordinary income or capital gains, or is there a special tax rate for those? Yeah. So that, that depends on the type of, of stock option you have, whether it's incentive stock options or non-qualified stock options. Got it. I see why you gave the disclaimer now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. This can get very complicated. Absolutely. So tell me like, um, let's say tax consideration on stock options. Just one example. Yeah. So, um, so an example I gave, you know, the $20 difference, like I said, is going to be taxable um, to you. And then, and so you have, you know, at the time, let's say $100 or $100 a share um, that you've exercised. And so you had $120 that the stock was worth. So that $20 difference is taxable. So at this point, you might have, you know, 100 shares at valued at $120. If you go later on and sell the stock, let's say it increases to $150 a share. Then that difference between the 150 that you sell it at later and the 120 that was the value when you exercise that's also taxable again as a as a capital gain. Got it. Okay. So yeah. So you got two 
points where you have to consider the taxation when you first exercise and then when you sell later. Yeah. And then with, with restricted stock, um, it's it's a little bit different. So restricted stocks um, units are taxable as ordinary income on the day that they vest. Okay. And so that's because they're they're basically just giving you stock, just like a, a similar to a cash bonus, like I said. And so there, if, you're, if your company gives you 100 shares valued at $100 a share, then that entire amount or the entire value is taxable on that day that they, that you receive the stock. And then if you go to sell it later and it's valued at a higher price, then the difference between the sell date and the day you received it is also taxable. Got it. So Uncle Sam is always going to get the piece. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No matter what. Yeah, no, this is a very complicated stuff. So there's a great opportunity here for, like you said, sitting down with a financial planner or a CPA or tax professional that can help you navigate this. Because I would imagine if you're leaving the company, then you have to take that into consideration as well, as far as like if you're vested and want to sell and things of that sort. Yeah. And so that, that's one thing that, that people need to think about is there are rules around what happens to your stock. Um, your stock options or restricted stock units if you leave your job or if you become disabled or if you pass away. Um, so, so it's important to understand, you know, all the implications of, of you leaving the company and if you're leaving money on the table. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. We don't want to do that. So uh, can you tell us some of the other risks that are involved with these as well? Yeah. So the other piece is just the investment, the investment risk um, outside of taxes, which is a huge you know, consideration and it's very complicated. It's also very common for people to accumulate stock in their company because they just don't understand how, how this all works or they just want to avoid making decisions. So they might have, have stock and it just continues to accumulate. And that could be a big part of what of your net worth is your company stock. And so if you think about, you know, the fact that you get paid by your employer, so all of your salary, you know, your livelihood depends on the company, and then you have a lot of stock in the company, that could be very risky. So you never want to have all your eggs in one basket. Right. That is a good point. Yeah. Because, and you make, yeah, you went above and beyond just describing how there's investment risk, but also the fact that you get paid by your company. So (laughs) if you have all your eggs in one basket and your company goes under, now you lose your job, but also your investments go down as well, all at the same time, which is insane. So at some point, you might want to consider uh, a plan to somewhat like divest yourself from that as well, right? So that makes a lot of sense. Yes. For sure. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the difference like between the public and private companies when it comes to this? Yeah. So so basically, just to give you a little background, uh, public companies are companies that can be traded by the general public on a stock exchange. And then private companies are generally owned and traded by the company's founders, management, uh, employees, or private investors. And so it can't be traded on, this, on the public stock exchange. Okay. So a private company can become a public company by selling all or a portion of itself uh, through what's called an initial public offering or an IPO. I know a lot of people have heard about IPOs. Right. Yeah. So that's how a private company becomes public. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. You always get those phone calls every time one of those big companies is going public. Like, hey, how can I get in on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So I was going to say with stock options, uh, with a public company, you're eligible to exercise your stock options as soon as they best. And so with private companies, because you know they're not sold uh, freely, then some private companies will allow you to exercise your stock options before the company goes public. But that's just, you know, just depends on the company and and situation that you're in. Um, And then with restricted stock units, the main difference between public company restricted stock units and private company restricted stock units is when they vest. So with a public company, the stock will vest as long as you work for the company during that time required or if you meet those performance metrics. Uh, With a private company, you generally have to stay there for the time that they specify and then the company has to also go public. Got it. Okay. It so to be vested. there are some rules to consider. So vesting yeah. uh, basically means when you're entitled to to receive the stocks, basically, and, and they're yours to keep. Yes. So you might have to stay there a few years or some performance metric of some sort determined by your employer. Got it. Yeah, I appreciate that. So yeah, this is uh, so complicated, but like you said, it's become so common that I feel like people definitely need to get a little bit more familiarized with these things. Um, what would be some resources that for the listeners that you can recommend, like if somebody wants to maybe read more about it? Yeah, so there's a couple of great resources. Um, 
you know, we, we talked about the book that could be written about stock options. There actually is one. <laughs> it's called Consider Your Options. Um, that's an excellent resource. It has very clear and simple language for beginners. Okay. Uh, so that's a good book. And, uh, and then there's also a wealth front. Uh, they have a guide um, to equity and IPOs, and that's on their blog. So if you just go type in Wealthfront uh, in your search engine, you can find their blog, uh, Guide to Equity. And then um, there's another great blog uh, that's written by, by an attorney and CPA, and her is stockoptioncouncil.com. And so you can also re- subscribe to that blog and receive you know, monthly posts and, and information about stock compensation. Uh, and then finally, mystockoptions.com. Uh, it's also a great, great place to find information about all types of stock compensation, uh, but it can get a bit technical. God, no, I could imagine. I mean, it's hard to talk about this, uh, I think, at some level without getting technical, right? So I want to go back a little just to help understand some some of the ways that these things work. Just the simpler, you know, not the, the nitty gritty stuff, but for example, like when you get these stock options, uh, where are they? Like, do, do you open up a brokerage account? Are these things in a separate account with your employer? How does that work? Yes. Yeah, so, so generally, when your company gives you, you know, the this, this stock compensation, uh, whether it's restricted stock units or, or the stock options, uh, they will give you an agreement to sign. And then you have to open up a brokerage account. So they, they typically have a, a, a company or a custodian that they work with. And so in addition to accepting the offer to receive the stock options or the restricted stock units, you also have to open up the account. So that's where the stock will go once you, you know, receive it or, or exercise. Okay. So similar to a 401k where they, they open the account, uh, one of the custodians. Yes. Okay. Got it. Um, and then, uh, in terms of like, once these are vested, then you can, if you're entitled to, then you can go ahead and sell at any time, even while you're still employed, right? You don't have to wait till you retire or anything like that. Yeah. So as soon as, as soon as the stock is vested, um, for restricted stock units, it's, it's yours basically to, to sell as you own the stock. Um, you can sell it right away or you can choose to wait and sell it at a later date. Um, and then for the, for the stock options, then that basically gives you the right to purchase the, the stock and then you own it and you can sell it whenever you want. Okay. Got it. So if I want to, you know, use the money for a down payment for a house, whatever, that's an option that I can use. Yeah. And so that, that's the great thing about stock compensation is that you can actually use it as a way to meet your financial goals. So if you think about you know, your goals and how this additional income can help you reach your goals, um, it, it's a great, a great thing. Okay. Got it. So if you're out there, let's say you, you are about to switch jobs or you're in the market for a job, this is something else that you should consider in addition to 401k, health insurance, things of that sort as an overall compensation package. Yes, definitely. So, so yeah, I always say think of stock options and restricted stock as a part of your total compensation. Um, and it, it's something that can also be negotiated, just like your salary and your, your bonuses, things like that. Oh, interesting. You know, I'm glad you bring that up. So, so you can actually use that as a negotiating tool when you're applying for a job. Like, I want stock options. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, not not every company will give them to you, but like, it, I want a hundred shares right now. <laughs> <laughs> if a company does offer that as as part of their compensation package, you can you can definitely do a little bit of negotiating there. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I would have never thought of that. I would have just been like, all right, you know, they're giving me stock. Okay, cool. But I didn't realize that you could have some room for negotiation there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I love it. Um, so tell me, uh, I know this is a lot of information to pack in such a short amount of time, but for those listening, like what are some of like the top three takeaways that, that you would say to take away from this conversation? Yeah, so the first is, is just what we were talking about. Just think of stock options and restricted stock as a part of your total compensation um, and don't be afraid to negotiate. So that, that's the first one. And the second one is just make sure that you read all of your documents. So when your company gives you, just like they give you an employment offer or offer letter, uh, you know, they'll give you an, an, a letter to accept and receive the stock. Make sure that you read all the documents that come with that so you can understand how things work and how it impacts you. Okay. And then the third is just, you know, make sure you consult with a qualified financial planner or tax professional um, who's familiar with stock compensation Um, because they can they can really help you understand, you know, even job offers or how to negotiate things or how to manage your stock compensation uh, once you receive it. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you don't have to figure this all out on your own. Uh, I know like, yeah, when I've seen 401k plan documents, they could be 89 pages, you know? <laughs> they give you a lot of, a lot of complicated information. And, and in some cases, you know, the 
people in in human resources, they can't really help you. So, so you do need someone on your side to who understands all this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. No, this is great information. So if somebody has, uh, they just want to reach out to you, how do they find you, uh, you know, online, social media, things of that sort? Yes. So um, the easiest way to find me is, is through my website, which is financialstaples.com. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn under Chloe, uh, Chloe Moore. And I have links to my social media on my website as well for, for LinkedIn, Twitter, and, and Facebook. Okay, great. Uh, and for those listening, I will be putting all of uh, Chloe's contact information and every resource that she mentioned in the show notes. So be sure to go to onmywaytowealth.com. This is going to be episode eight. And then you'll see the show notes with the links for everything. So Chloe, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and also bring this information out in as simplest terms as you possibly can. Because, you know, (laughs) I'm a financial planner and this stuff confuses me too. So for those of you listening, I definitely don't feel bad if if it's a complicated topic for you. So (laughs) thank you so much. Just a quick disclaimer, build a better financial future, financial staples and retirement wealth advisors are not affiliated. Be sure to consult with your tax advisor, your financial planner or your attorney before you make any decisions that will impact you. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, shoot me an email at luis at onmywaytowealth.com. Thank you for listening to On My Way to Wealth. If you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. Send Luis an email at luis at onmywaytowealth.com. To read the show notes and the blog, please visit www.onmywaytowealth.com. Luis Rosa is an investment advisor representative of Retirement Wealth Advisors, Inc., an SEC registered investment advisor. Build a Better Financial Future and Retirement Wealth Advisors are not affiliated. Exposure to ideas and financial vehicles discussed should not be considered investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell any financial vehicle. This information should not be considered tax or legal advice. Individuals should consult with the professionals specializing in the fields of tax, legal, accounting, or investments regarding the applicability of this information for their situation. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Investments will fluctuate and when redeemed may be worth more or less than when originally invested. Thank you.